A month after the Dock Club standoff between India and China was resolved, China raised the issue with Bhutan. On his three-day visit to Thimpu, Chinese Foreign Minister Kong Xun Yuao discussed the boundary issue with the leaders of the Himalayan nation. China's Foreign Ministry spokesperson Geng Shuang said, and I quote, The two sides exchanged views on China, Bhutan ties and boundary issues and reached many agreements. The meeting is of prominence considering the fact that China has no diplomatic ties with Bhutan. The nation have an unresolved border dispute that has spanned several decades now. The Doklam Plateau is part of the disputed border where the boundaries of India, China and Bhutan meet. China has offered 269 square kilometer of area in the western sector to Bhutan in lieu of 100 square kilometer of Doklam. Bhutan refuses to accept this. India and China were locked in an over two month long military standoff near the boundary in Doklam Plateau. The standoff began in June when the Indian troops stalled a road building by the Chinese army in the area. The Indian army cited the disputed status of the region and its close proximity to India's artery in the northeast. Months after the Doklam standoff between India and China was resolved, China raised the issue with Bhutan. On his three-day visit to Timpu, Chinese Foreign Minister Kong discussed the boundary issue with the leaders of the Himalayan nation. China's Foreign Ministry spokesperson Geng said, and I quote, that the two sides exchanged views on China, Bhutan ties and boundary issues and reached many agreements. The meeting is of prominence considering the fact that the China has no diplomatic ties with Bhutan. The nations have an unresolved border dispute that has spawned several decades now. The importance is that the China still continue to desire Doklam, whereas Bhutan has said strictly no. And in fact, such was an offer that in lieu of 100 square kilometer, China was willing to part 269 square kilometer of area in the other sector to Bhutan. Bhutan has said no. It has great significance to India from Doklam. Uh, the China will have the bird's eye view and at a very striking distance from India's chicken neck, which connects West Bengal to the northeastern sector. It's a small corridor and it's of vital importance to India. And I'm joined by uh, Gaurav Sharma from uh, Beijing. Uh, Gaurav, my question is why such strong insistence on Doklan that the China is willing to give 269 square kilometers in lieu of 100 square kilometers, which is Doklan? Uh, this is, uh, you know, this was this has been an offer which has been made by uh, Beijing to uh, Thimpu uh, before. If you say that this is not the offer made by uh, uh, Beijing uh, in the meeting which happened between its foreign minister and its uh, and its uh, Bhutanese uh, counterpart, uh, let me tell you this is very important because Beijing is trying to reach, or in fact China is trying to reach out to Bhutan at a time when Beijing's tension with Delhi is cooling off. So it's very, very important. Now China is secretly going to Thimpu, reaching out to Thimpu and trying to uh, score, uh, trying to settle its boundary dispute. And you know, Doklam is of very, very strategic impo importance to all the three countries. You know, it is at a, it, it is at the tri-junction of uh, India, China, and Bhutan border, and that's so very important because it's very close to India, India's arterial uh, Siliguri corridor, which is uh, which connects uh, India's northeast with the rest of the country. So it's very, very important. And that was the reason of this, that was the reason of standoff when uh, Indian troops objected to Chinese road building in that area. And if you see, uh, when, uh, when the question was asked to Gang Shuang, what was discussed, he actually said that boundary issue was discussed between Bhutan and China. So if the boundary issue was discussed, it means that Doklam has certainly uh, figured uh, in the talks. And there's, a, there's another statement that, uh, by Chinese foreign ministry says, which is that China respects Bhutan's territorial integrity. And let me tell you, last year when uh, there was a standoff between Indian and Chinese military, Chinese media came out in the open and accused India of meddling into 
China, uh, Bhutan's domestic affairs. It also blames India uh, because uh, because uh, it says that in, because of India, Bhutan doesn't have a diplomatic ties with. Uh, uh, with Beijing, and in fact, Beijing has been trying its hard to establish a diplomatic relationship with Bhutan because its its its, its strategic importance is really it's it's it's, it's of high it's uh, it's of high strategic importance to China because if China comes on Doklam, it will have a it will have a bird's eye view over India's arterial uh, corridor. Thank you, Gaurav. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this uh, update. Now moving on in the bulletin, Indian government has claimed that the Indian deposits in the Swiss banks have fallen by 35% in the year 2017. Finance Minister Piyush Goyal also said that the deposits fell by 80% since Modi government came to power four years ago. Remember that there were some reports earlier that the Indian money in Swiss banks had risen by 50% last year. Minister Piyush Goyal cited data from the Bank for International Settlements to back his claim Money on which the tax is not paid is often called black money in India. Modi government had come to power with the promise of eliminating black money from the economy. Government and the opposition often spar on black money identification procedure and the way it is calculated. Now let's listen in to what India's finance minister said today. It is frequently assumed that any assets held by Indian residents in Switzerland are undeclared. ब्रैकेट में सो कॉल ब्लैक मनी ये उनका हमें जवाब आए उन्होंने ये भी लिखा है टू एनालाइज इंडियन रेजिडेंस डिपॉजिट हेल्ड इन स्विट्जरलैंड अनदर डेटा सोर्स शुड बी यूज जो करेक्ट डेटा सोर्स है दिस इज द लोकेशनल बैंकिंग स्टेटिस्टिक्स विच द स्विस नेशनल बैंक कलेक्ट इन कोलेबोरेशन विद द बैंक फॉर इंटरनेशनल सेटलमेंट now I'm joined by my colleague Sumit Chaturvedi from Newsroom. Sumit, tell me how do, how do we interpret this uh, data uh, where it's being said that the deposits are uh, have been reduced by 80% and how does that accounting takes place? That you know that this deposit is down by 80%. Well, absolutely, Kartikya. Even when the reports came last month, there were doubts being raised that who uh, this kind of money, where is it coming from? Have they taken into account the NRI money or have they taken into account how to know the, uh, they know the resident status of Indians? Well, these were, these were questions which were not answered then today. A uh, number of these questions have been answered. So Swiss, uh, in fact, the settlement system is BI through BIS, Bureau of International Settlements. And through this, uh, what they have reached on the conclusion is that actually the money, the black money has come down by 80% in the last three years. Because Swiss banks, they take into account a lot of things which are happening between Switzerland and India and in other countries like the the uh, the business of swiss banks and their branches in india was earlier taken into account as black money this is not black money and all money that is deposited from india to the uh, these banks in in switzerland it's not black money either so that's what the clarification has come from this side and it has been said that the letter was written by swiss ambassador to india later on the finance minister of india took that into account and they have now reached to the, to the conclusion that this money is not black money black money on the other hand has reduced by 80 percent the reports which came around 25 days ago said that Overall, these, uh, India has seen 50% jump in black money to over 1 billion francs, which is around 7,000 crore rupees. And there was a big hue and cry, how is it possible, how can that happen when on one side government is trying to uh, fight black money, how is it increasing? So now the clarification has come that all money is not black money and a lot of factors will go into it. They have gone into it, in fact, which includes the fiduciary liability also resident status of Indians and also the business being done by Swiss Bank and their branches while they are in India. But is it also because of the fact that somehow because of the crackdown which has taken place in India, it's being diverted to other safe havens? Well, uh, yes, partly that's possible, Kartikeya, but because the whole money is now the focused in uh, on, on Switzerland, but new havens, havens have come out. First is uh, this definitely Cayman Islands, there's a Panama also, also their uh, Seychelles is one of these uh, we can say that the havens where black money is usually parked. Dubai has come out like a very, very recent place where black money is being stashed in real estate assets. Mauritius used to be other, uh, other one other destination, but after DTAA with Mauritius, which is double taxation avoidance agreement, Mauritius is no longer easily, you know, it can be used easily by, by the people who want to uh, escape from tax pay, the tax uh, taxation authorities net. But yes, these, these places are the new places where black money is going, at, but the whole focus, unfortunately, is on Swiss bank. But we have a new agreement with them signed last year in December, 
through which we will start receiving the names of these these people who have actually escaped the tax uh, men's net by uh, next year 2019 thank you sumit thank you for this update on the first leg of his five day three nation africa tour indian prime minister narendra modi has announced a 200 billion dollars line of credit to rwanda prime minister modi had wide ranging talks with the rwandan president paul kagame and discussed various measures to boost the bilateral ties between the two nations as part of the two day visit PM Modi will also meet the business leaders and the Indian communities in Kigali the prime minister also addressed Indian diaspora in Rwanda where he promised to open an Indian mission to improve connection with Indians prime minister Narendra Modi gifted 200 cows sources locally to a village in Rwanda's eastern province as part of the Girinka program under the scene each and every poor family is given one cow each the national social protection schemes was personally initiated by the Rwandan president Indian prime minister Narendra Modi has now reached Uganda before he heads to Johannesburg for the BRICS summit prime minister Modi's visit came a day after Chinese president Xi Jinping visited Rwanda this is the first time that a Chinese head of state has paid a state visit to the African nation after Rwandan president Xi Jinping will pay a state visit to South Africa and attend 10th BRICS summit on Wednesday PM Modi will also head to South Africa to attend the BRICS summit in Johannesburg and I'm joined by Michael Balake the correspondent from uh, Kampala Uganda the prime minister Narendra Modi has gifted 200 cows sourced locally uh, to a village in Rwanda's eastern province as part of the uh girinka scheme uh, can you please tell me uh, why this scheme is so important hello there um well prime minister modi's i'll give you uh, i'll start with a few details that prime minister modi has actually arrived in uganda now just a few uh, minutes ago uh, he touched down at entebbe international airport and he is right now in a meeting uh, with president yuri museveni the ugandan president uh, prime minister modi has uh, received a full military honors uh, while he was here in uganda now his perspective the perspective and how uh, prime minister modi is seen to visit these countries is that uh, this uh, opens uh, of course a new area of cooperation between the uh, india and africa in general i would say that uh, this is corporate in cooperation in the area of food security we're talking about the area of security these are key issues for africa and key issues uh, for india and we have also seen in rwanda issues to do with renewable energy especially on the solar front uh, so prime minister modi has signed actually some uh, cooperation agreements while he was there with them in uganda of course is expected uh, to also sign uh, some lines of credit and extend lines of credit in the area of agriculture and in the area of energy this mm -hmm. in a way uh, in a way to put and uh, increase india's influence in africa the china is also seems to be a contender uh, and china has a very strong uh, presence in africa so when we talk about prime minister modi's visit uh, to africa and its three nation tour what's the perspective we need to keep in terms of broader interaction of india with uganda well on the side of china it is true china has a lot of influence uh, you know as you may know that african countries are quite poor uh, most of them are and africa has not been positioned especially when you talk about africa Uh, in relation to countries like Rwanda and 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 Uganda they have not been able to put in place strategies that can remove this poverty from the people and uh, what happens is that china has the money it has it's a superpower it's seen as a superpower and has all the money that uh, africa needs countries african countries especially in sub saharan africa need to get out of this poverty and that is the notion that when you use money you get out of poverty and china's influence has been key especially in terms of uh, if it means grants or loans a lot of money has been borrowed on the other side india has instead uh, been investing in industry in industry and uh, employing uh, lots lots of ugandans are employed in indian industries uh, in uganda here but on the other side of course uh, 
uh, while China has a lot of influence, uh, it puts the level of how uh, African country is going to be able to pay this debt from China. China has a lot of has given us a lot of money, but there have been issues to do with governance, and that is quite uh, an issue uh, going on right now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining me. So the Indian Prime Minister is in a three-nation tour visit to Africa. And uh, this also includes a meeting he may have uh, with the Chinese counterpart in Johannesburg, which is South Africa. We just asked to go before it goes to polls. Pakistan is all geared up. The deployment of the forces is now complete with over 370,000 security personnel stationed across length and breadth of the nation. The stationing of troops come amid a recent decision by the election authorities to grant military officers broad powers inside polling booths. The decision has stoked fear of possible manipulations ahead of the electoral context. The short but shrill campaigning ended yesterday with a major leader holding their final rallies. The ruling Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz has suffered a major setback with the conviction of its major leaders Nawaz Sharif and his daughter Maryam Nawaz. In the absence of the two Sharif's brothers, Shahbaz Sharif has become the face of the party. The contest is largely being viewed as a two-party fight between the Pakistan Muslim League Nawaz party and the cricketing legend Imran Khan's Pakistan's Tariq Saf. The PTI leader is hoping to secure a victory is a tacit support of the army. The election is also important for another party, Pakistan People's Party. 29-year-old Sikhian of the Bhutto family, Bilawal, is making his electoral debut and is expected to play the kingmaker. Son of former Prime Minister Benazir Bhutto, who was assassinated 11 years ago, Bilawal Bhutto is contesting the polls from his mother's seat, Layari. The country has witnessed massive violence in the run-up to these elections. A string of suicide bomb attack at the political rallies killed nearly 160 people in less than a week, including a candidate from Imran Khan's party on Sunday. A total of 849 directly elected seats are up for the grabs in the elections and over 12,500 candidates, including a number of hardline clerics, are contesting in the election to the parliament and four provincial assemblies included. Islamabad High Court has sent notice to Pakistan Tariq and Saf Chairman Imran Khan. The summon was sent after a plea pertaining to Imran Khan's disqualification was filed. The petitioner had argued that Imran Khan did not mention that the name of his daughter Tyron from Sita White while filing his nomination papers. The cricketer turned politician who is the front runner for the post of the Prime Minister is contesting from five seats in Islamabad, Punjab, Sindh and Khyber Pakhtunwa. As he is also contesting elections in Islamabad to NA53 area against Shahid Khan Abbasi, who succeeded Nawaz Sharif as the Prime Minister of Pakistan. In a tragic instance, 60 people have died and more than 104 others have been injured after forest fires raged in near the capital Athens, making deadliest base to hit the country in a decade. The fire in the Mati village was by far the country's worst since blazes devastated the southern Peloponnese Peninsula in August 2007, killing dozens. The fire was one of the several that broke out in the country amid sweltering heat wave. Greece has issued an urgent appeal for people to ensure that they save themselves and don't get stuck to the property. It has appealed to tackle fires which has raged uncontrolled in several places across the country, destroying homes and disrupting major transport links. In Greece, Greece said it needed air and land assistance from European Union partners. Cyprus, Spain has offered assistance already. Firefighters battled the wildfires that raged through Greek seaside areas. Military drones remained in the air in the high winds to help officials direct more than 600 firefighters on the ground 
Rescue crew reported finding bodies of more than 20 people huddled closely together near a beach northeast of the capital, Athens. Prime Minister Alexis Siparas cut short a visit to Bosnia and returned to Athens to preside an emergency response meeting with fire chiefs and government officials. Είναι μια δύσκολη στιγμή για την Αττική. Είναι μια δύσκολη νύχτα για την Ελλάδα. Αυτή τη στιγμή πάνω από 600 άνδρες και γυναίκες της πυροσβεστικής επιχειρούν. Πάνω από 300 οχήματα επιχειρούν σε τρία μεγάλα μέτωπα. Hot weather conditions continue in Japan. Temperature in Japan have hit a record high. The officials are issuing a fresh warning to stay safe. At least 65 people have died within one week. The thermometer peaked at 41.1 degrees Celsius or 160 degrees Fahrenheit in Kumagaya near Tokyo. This broke the previous national record of 41 degrees Celsius in 2013. In fact, more than a dozen cities have seen temperatures of 40 degrees Celsius. Japan's disaster management agency has urged people to stay in air-conditioned spaces, drink water and rest to prevent heat exhaustion. This summer, more than 10,000 people have been taken to hospital as a result of the heat. Number of senior citizens died as a result of the intense heat in prefectures surrounding Tokyo. Japan summers are notoriously hot and humid and hundreds of people die each year from heat stroke. Today marks the hottest day of the year in the United Kingdom. Temperature as high as 33.3 degrees Celsius was recorded in the Santum Downham in Suffolk. A three-day health watch alert still remains in place for much of the east and southeast of London and England. Warnings have been issued urging the public to avoid sun and stay indoors between 11 and 3 p.m. while the heat is strongest. The National Farmers Union has warned of crop parched to bone and livestock farmers using winter rations. Lack of rain has made weather conditions worse. Several places have had 54 consecutive dry days, worsening the heat condition. 